I've been extremely fortunate because, you know, with, you know, the war that's happened in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, the global war on terror, the counter IED fight, it, like, if you look at EOD, my, my profession when I was in the military, especially for the Air Force, like prior to the counter IED stuff, Air Force was responsible for base response yeah. and runway recovery. A bag was left so, here, go blow it up kind of thing. Right. Or in a conventional warfare sense, you know, if you if you go out, if we go out and we set up a forward operating base and it has an airstrip so it can ferry logistics or launch fighters, things like that. If the enemy, who supposedly will have some kind of air force or something, <laughs> they bomb the runway so that we can't take off. Well, some of those ordinances are going to dud, like the the United States um, ordinance dud rate is like ten percent, right? Yeah. So if there's a bomber that drops a freaking CBU or a cluster bomb munition that has hundreds of submunitions on it, and ten percent of them don't dud, or excuse me, ten percent of them dud out you know, somebody has to go clear those, yeah. right? Because the people can't repair the runway while there's active explosives out, right? So that was the Air Force EOD mission was to keep the runways operational and to, you know, like you said, you know, suspect packages for whatever reason. And any other ordinance that the enemy drops on the base elsewhere, we have to go take care of those. Like the Air Force was a base response mission. Yeah, and that that's but, probably drastically changed because I mean, when you went in, even we the 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 whole like terrorist insurgency type stuff wasn't really that mainstream yet. So you, I'm sure exactly. your your consistent training throughout your time in the Air Force built you up to be able to handle that response. First, in basic training, it was probably about more safer, cleaner environments where you you have control of the environment with a single device. Versus you know, there's some guy with a a cell phone or a, a battery somewhere that's going to detonate you. Yeah, a lot of it. So when I was deploying, you know, my first deployment was in 2007. And it was even worse for the guys before that because we had to learn the hard way. Yeah. A lot of people died. Um, the, the enemy tactics and the way they employed devices and the lack of proper equipment to combat those devices. Like if you think back, I mean, I can't remember the, the year that the MRAPs rolled out the, the mine resistance. It was after I got out. It was post 2005. I think they were just hitting the ground in 2005. Yeah, that sounds about right. Cause I remember pictures from 2005 of like the Humvees with freaking sandbags on them and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, when they invaded so, Iraq in 03, they actually had the uh, TARPs Humvees, not even the Up Armor Humvees for a lot of them. Yeah, they had the turtle backs and stuff, yeah. Like stuff out of freaking, uh, what's it called, uh, Black Hawk Down, yeah. right? Those Humvees. Exact same thing. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Probably the same one. So so it, it, it was a hard lesson, and it took a while to, to set in. Um, but, you know, around 2006, 2007, we started getting pretty good about countering it. We weren't perfect, but we were getting a lot better. And that's when I started deploying. Um, and uh, lucky enough for us, you know, EOD gets treated pretty well yeah. in that sense of the, you know, of it. Because we always had, we, we drove a, a six-wheeled Cougar that was outfitted for EOD. And they changed the nomenclature once it was outfitted for EOD. It was called the uh, the CHIRV, the uh, Joint EOD Rapid Response Vehicle. And it was probably the most heavily armored vehicle in any route clearance convoy. Um, the Cougars were, my pick, the most, <laughs> the greatest freaking MRAP that's ever been built. Like, that thing is a beast. Um, but, um yeah, so there's a, hard, a lot of hard lessons learned. Um, and a lot of my training for that counter IED stuff came from two places. One was people rotating back that, you know, just saw something. Yeah. And they could. This is know, the technique. This is the, the way that they're doing okay. it now. Or, yeah. 
Right. And then they incorporate that into the uh, home station training. Right. So they set up snares for you to practice on things like that. The other was the act when I went out, uh, when I deployed the, um, the pre-deployment training was actually pretty spot on for the EOD side for, so for air force EOD, we, when we deployed, we had to, um, go to two separate schools. One was called uh, combat skills training which was ran by the army and it was basically meant to teach you to do army infantry type stuff. And a lot of people hate on it, but I did get a lot of good information from it. Uh, mostly like convoy tactics. Yeah. Which at the time I didn't realize how important that would be. But once I got in country, most of my missions were route clearance, which means convoys day and night, eight, 10, 12, however long it takes hours a day convoys right so that was extremely valuable and then obviously all the stuff that comes you're good that comes with dogs all the stuff that comes along with that the uh the radio etiquette you know how to use your radios you know how to call medevac nine lines things like that so all that was extremely great and then the second school was the um the eod centric kind of it it was uh called gator is the global anti-terror anti-terrorism orientation readiness or something like that it was basically in alabama they would you get a bunch of crusty old eod guys that set up devices for you all day and you just run them hours and hours and hours running devices nice inner inner devices obviously but very cool. So, so um, I, I know it'll be pretty quick because there's not a whole lot to talk about on it, but how long did you serve? Just a little under eight years. Um, my After my second deployment, um, it wasn't anything heroic, but I did get blown up in my vehicle. Um, it was really funny, actually, because in a convoy, you're, you're pretty much – supposed to drive in the tire tracks of the person in front of you yeah especially over dirt terrain because one of the most common enemy um tack or not tactics but enemy weapons is a pressure plate Mm -hmm. right so it's it's a device that's meant that when it gets pressure on top of it it explodes right in very layman's terms but so it's meant to go off underneath a vehicle higher right so the common thought process is you know if you're following somebody and you drive exactly where they did well they didn't get blown up so there must not be a pressure plate there right so driving their tracks and that's literally exactly what i was doing but i just must have caught it in the most right perfect. on the edge yeah wow. something and um it was it was a it was a decent uh it was a decent bomb i think after the, we did the post blast on it, we figured it was like about 75 to 100 pounds mm. of homemade explosives. Um, but a big uh, shout out to Force Protection and the Cougars that they make. Um, like I was, I was driving and it blew up pretty much right outside my door. And it was very loud. And it was very shaky, like the entire, like everything shook real quick. And I lost, I lost consciousness for just a split second. Um, and then I woke up without any breath in my lungs. Like mm. it, it felt like the somebody compression punched guy, me. Yeah. Yeah. And I was coughing a lot. Um, other than that, like I felt fine. Like I opened the door, I hopped out. And everybody was actually really surprised to see me get out. And they're like, whoa, 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 take it easy, bro. You okay? <laughs> yeah. You okay? And I was like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, look at our tire. That thing got messed up. It's you almost know? like a surreal moment, right? Like that didn't really happen or validating that it even happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 kind of crazy. I don't I don't really when when people are asking me about my war stories, like I don't really include that because it was kind of a normal occurrence. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like we were getting blown up extremely often. And most of the time, because of the great MRAPs that we have, 
it, it wasn't catastrophic in nature. It mm -hmm. didn't cause a lot of human casualties. You know, people get out and, you know, they'd be discompopulated and, you know, a little woozy. But for the most part, they were fine. I mean, there was a few occasions where there were more complex devices that were meant to penetrate armor. Yeah. Or, or directional were, type stuff. and Directional yeah. EFPs, um, RPGs, you know. Obviously, an RPG is a, a device, but, you know, when you get into contact with actual enemy insurgents, you know, those were, those can mess up your day. Yeah, my but understanding is a lot of it was the uh, shape of the hole when they switched the MRAPs having the V-shaped holes versus the flat surfaces of the uh, the Humvees is what yeah, was killing a lot of people in them. Exactly. Yeah, and, and they learned that lesson real hard. I had to do a post-blast on a uh, striker, a, um, which is a you know, assault vehicle that's kind of like a mini tank, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, but it had a flat bottom. Yeah. And they learned real quick that if you have a flat bottom vehicle, because it basically, if, if it blows up underneath you, right, that, that explosive overpressure has to go somewhere. So the more surface area it has to contact, the more catastrophic the damage is, right? Yeah. So if you've got a V-shaped hole, like the MRAPs are, right? they got a V-shaped hole, it kind of vents it outward. Yeah. So the, so the MRAPs are designed to vent that, that explosive and like literally everything on the outside just kind of shears off of it. All the cabinets, all the fenders, yeah. the wheels, the suspension, everything shears off, but that hole stays intact, yeah. right? And there's, you know, been very few things that have actually pierced the hole. Now they've, you know, they've done it. You know, yeah. you pack enough explosives and it will breach it, but it takes a lot. Yeah. So. Yeah, I know we um in my career field we were sh sending back vehicles and we uh we regularly with the Humvees we'd be sending them back and you you know something bad happened in them just by the way they look and. Uh, um, yeah. my from the people in my career field that I've talked to, at once those MRAPs, they they would go, they'd go into the junkyard. They wouldn't be sending them back for research because there usually was not much casualties around them too. So it's really good. I mean, they're they're beasts to have to move around. They're massive compared to a Humvee just in sheer volume and size. But I mean, it definitely protected people a lot better. I know I'm appreciative yeah, of that. Yeah, and the. Uh... And for a long time, you know, a lot of those guys, they had to run the Humvees. I mean, they upgraded the armor over time, like the Frag 5 kits, I think they were called, which is basically they just took the door and they put like a million pounds of armor on it and hoped that would save people. They increased the weight of those things by 3,000 pounds by putting up armor on them. It's crazy. It's, it's almost 50% yeah. heavier. And it made them 50% less maneuverable, yeah. too, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, high speed would be like 35 miles per hour in one verse, you know, 50. Yeah, <laughs> and whenever we went out, like, if if we had a up-armored Humvee on our convoy, like, you actually had to alter your mission plan. Because a lot of times, like, you know, route clearance, depending on route clearance or QRF, when, Whenever you're maneuvering, it's about your mission, right? If yeah. your mission is that if you're trying to find every single IED on a road, then you go until you find an IED, right? Yeah. If you're trying to maneuver from point A to point B, then it's probably not smart to be found by an IED. Right? Yeah. So you you, <laughs> you bypass, right? But if you have one of those Humvees in your group, you know it's it's hard to bypass off road, especially in bad weather conditions. They just get stuck. Um, if, if you get <laughs> off the hard pack, you know, because a lot of the stuff out there, it's all farmland. You know, yeah. it's poppy fields. It's you know, so if you're down in like where where I was in Kandahar, and it's in the winter, it's just nothing but rain. Well, it's it has that fine slosh. fine dust stuff in the dirt. Yeah, and, yeah. Like, collegiate dust. Yeah. So once all that gets really wet, you can't, you know, unless you have a real beast of a vehicle, you can't drive through it, yeah. right? You'll just get stuck. And sure enough, everywhere we went, the freaking Humvees, those up on Humvees, man, they couldn't keep up in the, the mud. No, yeah, they're so, 
they're junk. <laughs> That's what, when I see one. I don't know about you, but if I see one on the road, like people that bought the uh, the H ones and drive them around, I'm like, why would you, why would you want it right. or one of those? <laughs> so you've obviously never been in the military. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They got high centered a lot too. Like there'd be you know berms or whatever you're trying to go over, and you'll just see they're so long, just yep. teeter tottering. <laughs> people standing on the front or the back of them trying to uh, <laughs> to get them to get some traction. <laughs> 